Thanks for coming. My name is Tiffany Bates. I'm the president of the Federal Society here at George Mason. Um, we're really glad that you came out today, and we're very grateful for our speakers. Um, just a note about Federalist Society. Um, the Federalist Society is a group of conservatives and libertarians um, interested in current legal affairs. We believe that the state exists to preserve freedom. The separation of powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the Sorry, the emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. Um, we will be hosting several events uh, this year. A particular note, um, you can grab a flyer on your way out. Um, we have, we're hosting a Supreme Court preview with three great Supreme Court litigators. We're co-hosting with the George Mason Supreme Court Clinic on October 3rd. Um, and the Honorable Bill Pryor from the 11th Circuit um, will be coming to give a talk on Justice Scalia on October 5th. Um, I will turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Professor Rapkin, to introduce our debaters. So I'm just going to spend two minutes uh, more or less reminding you who these people are. Uh, Josh Blackman is a graduate of this very- Class of 2009. <laughs> there we go. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. He took my course on international Your first law. class at Mason. You're my first class here. Said that was a great subject. I'm doing something else. <laughs> uh, he's been teaching at the South Texas Law School in Houston. He's associate professor. Uh, he's published two books on the Obamacare debate and uh, quite a few articles on a range of things. He blogs at joshblackman.com. Uh, Is that right? That's right. Yeah, justblackman.com. And if you uh, miss any part of today's proceedings, I wish to see them again. He'll be posting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the principal authors of an amicus brief in U.S. v. Texas, the uh, case of the uh, of our speakers we'll be speaking about, and I'm one of the signatories, so I'm on his side to that extent, but. Um, William Sermon here is my colleague, so I'm glad to hear from him as well. Um, he went to a different law school in New Haven, right? Yeah. And, and uh, recovered from that. <laughs> <laughs> He's written a lot of books on several subjects, and many articles, and um, has, I guess, a different view of um, how important borders are. And we'll have a chance to talk. Borders? What, what are borders? Yeah, no. So, uh, the format is we're going to Same view as the Statue of Liberty has. <laughs> so which, is what, was, which was built at an immigration checkpoint. No, the format is... A checkpoint to let people <laughs> in, <laughs> not keep uh, them out. Sorry. <laughs> You're interrupting the moderator's time now. Uh, 15 minutes overview from Josh Blackman, 15 minutes response from... Uh, Ilya Soman, and then I'll chat five minutes to say whatever they want to say in response and turn this over to you. So, Josh. All right, Professor Rapkin, it's a pleasure. Again, uh, Professor Rapkin was my international law professor. This was my property professor. I'm now a property law professor in Houston, and I see so much of myself in Ilya, except in immigration, <laughs> we could not disagree more. In fact, this is one of the rare cases where we don't agree. So I'll say at the outset that this is not a policy debate. Um, as a matter of policy, I actually support President Obama's exec, uh, immigration policies, both the DREAM Act and the, uh, uh, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. I, I support his agenda, and I'm with Ilya on that. I don't agree with the manner in which he enacted it. So my purpose for the immigration actions taken, explain why I think they violate the Constitution, and offer a few preemptive rejoinders to the points Ilya is going to make, because I've done this with him a number of times. So our story actually begins with something called the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act was a bill that would have provided a pathway to citizenship for the DREAMers. These are people who came to the country as minors without any sort of lawful status. They went to school, they graduated from high school, they were law-abiding citizens. They're, they're good people. The DREAM Act would have given these people a path to citizenship. And again, this is a bill that, as a matter of policy, I would have voted for and I would have supported. Um, this bill managed to pass in the Democrat-controlled House of Representatives, but was filibustered in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Democrats who filibustered the bill, that part's often lost to history. So the DREAM Act was defeated. 
So generally speaking, when a bill is defeated, you have one or two options. You can either wait to the next election, you make a big political point about it. What did President Obama do? He took an executive action that became known as DACA, D-A-C-A. -A. stood for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. What did DACA not do? Now, be very clear. DACA was not amnesty. This phrase is used so often incorrectly. Amnesty means change of legal status like citizenship. That is not what we have here. Instead, DACA used something called deferred action. What is deferred action? Um, grossly speaking, it means the executive says, we will put you at the bottom of the line. We will not deport you. Um, you're not here legally, but we won't remove you. Okay. Oh, by the way, we'll also give you something called lawful presence. Now, what's lawful presence? That is not citizenship. That is not uh, a permanent residency. It's this temporary discretionary status that critically gives you the work authorization. So the DREAMers could stay here uh, as long as they were getting renewed for this program and were given work authorization to go get a job and, and not have to work off the books. Okay. DACA, this pocketed the exact same. It gave them not the same thing as the DREAM Act, but something awfully close to it, right? It's not permanent. But for the present time, in the last four or five years at this point, they can stay here and legally work. Okay, so that's the first executive action taken. Fast forward till 2014. You may remember something called the Gang of Eight Bill. This was Marco Rubio's uh, 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 coup de grace, so to speak, right? People nodding their heads. The, the Gang of Eight Bill would have been comprehensive immigration reform. What did it do? It would have basically given a pathway to citizenship for about 11 million aliens in the United States. Again. As a matter of policy, I actually support this bill. I would have voted for it if I were in Congress. I am not. I'm a lowly law professor. So the bill here actually managed to pass the Senate due to this Gang of Eight compromise. As we learn in School House Rocks, after a bill passes one house, it goes across to the other house. But then something crazy happened right in your backyard in Virginia. Eric Cantor. You may recall that Eric Cantor was the majority leader of you know, the two-ranking Republican in the House, and he was primaried by another professor. Um, Two days before Eric Cantor's primary, John Boehner, the speaker, said, we're going to bring this immigration bill to a vote and we're going to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Okay, his timing was poor. So after David Bratt beat Eric Cantor, all the Republicans said, oh my God, we're not doing this, right? I am not getting primaried. I am not backing this amnesty bill. No, no, no. This is before Donald Trump was even a thing, right? It's like, we are not doing this. So on June 30th, 2014, um, Speaker Boehner said, uh, yeah, we're not going to vote on this immigration bill. Not going to happen. That day, that very day in the Rose Garden, President Obama appeared and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, when Congress doesn't act, I will. Right? When Congress does not take any action, I will. I am not going to deal with this sort of intransigence. So what happened after that is a fascinating study in administrative law and a class I encourage you to take. Over the next the Homeland Security Department proposed several different iterations of how the president take executive action to benefit this class of aliens. Um, according to one account in Politico, DHS gave the president 60, 60, 60 policy. And what did the president say? Doesn't go far enough. Keep going further. Keep going further. Cover more people. Cover more people. And finally, on November 14th, 2014, Two weeks after the election, that's actually very important. Two weeks after the election, the president announced the policy known as DAPA, D-A-P-A. -A. It stands for Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents. Okay? While DACA granted deferred action status to about one and a half million dreamers, DAPA would have granted deferred action status to about between four and five million aliens. Specifically, these are people who came to the United States and had U.S. citizen children. Now, contrary to the, the anchor baby myth, if you come to the United States and have people cannot give you a green card right away, you have to wait until the child's 21 and then you first petition for it. What DAPA said was, if you have a U.S. citizen child who's a citizen by virtue of the 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship, we will give you deferred action and we'll give you work authorization in the interim. Okay? So these are these two policies. I want to go through this chronology very clearly for you. Congress considered a bill. Congress said no. The president did something awfully similar to it and specifically said, because you won't act, I will. The reason why I'm making this chronology very clear to you is there's a constitutional clause, which I hope you study in common law, 
and you should study, which is called the Take Care Clause. The Constitution imposes on the President a duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. What is this word faith? Well, maybe perhaps one else, you've taken contracts. The notion of good faith stretches all equity. The Greeks, the Romans, every society had a notion of good faith and fair dealings. And, and I've done some original research that I think the Take Care Clause is best read as imposing a good faith duty on the President. As I'll argue in my remaining time, DAPA and DACA are not good faith exercises of the President's authority. Okay, why? Now, the first argument that my, my, my good friend will raise is discretion. We don't agree here. There are between 11 and 17 million aliens here. The number is hard to pin down. But there's a significant number of aliens here who do not have any sort of lawful status. It is impossible to remove every single one. It will be a humanitarian disaster. I don't care what Donald Trump says. It cannot be done. It can't be done. It, we, we, we agree on that one, right? It cannot be done, and I don't think it should be done. It would be a poor use of resources. You, you, you can't do it. No matter how high the damn wall is, you can't, you cannot stop this, you can't resolve this problem, okay? Another 40 feet tall, it's not going to work. They go tunnels, it, it doesn't matter. Where do Ilya and I disagree? When does discretion become a deliberate abdication? Okay? And the framework I've developed argues this. If the president's actually using this program as a means to husband or to conserve resources in a limited matter, I have no problem. I have no qualms with that. But DAPA and DACA are something else. These are not simple efforts to uh, decrease expenditures. In fact, it actually requires more work for the federal government to process these. Okay? If the president had simply said, if you come to us and say that you're an outstanding person, we'll simply put you in the bottom of the list and not deport you, like give you a do not deport card, I'd be okay with that. I, I mean, I think it, I'd have some qualms, but I wouldn't object to it. The problem here is granting what's called lawful presence. The president is trying to change the status of millions of aliens that Congress specifically said shall not be changed. Congress said, we're not voting here, status quo remains. The very people that Congress did not want to change the status for, those are the people who are benefiting from DACA and DAPA. And for that reason, I think we have a clear-cut case of bad faith. Uh, the example I gave before where the president's lawyer said, hey, you can do this. Obama said, no, not enough. What about this? No, no, keep going further. So we don't even have the check of the executive branch reigning in the out-of-control executive. The president was on the Colbert show a couple years ago where he said that, you know, I'm bound by the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department. They tell me what I can or cannot do. Baloney. He's ignored them a number of times. And this case gets a, no, more power, more power, more, 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 more. Okay? So... That's the general premise. So we don't agree in, I'm sorry, we, 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 we agree on the general idea of discretion, but we disagree about how this discretion is being exercised. Um, Ilya's second argument, which I won't touch um, at all, is an originalist argument, meaning Congress power over a uh, uh, natural, I'm sorry, not, I'll, I want to phrase it, I want to phrase it uh, fairly. Immigration. Immigration, I'm sorry. I, I, the word in the Constitution is naturalization. Congress has a naturalization power. Uh, Professor Soman says that does not entail power of immigration. Does that, does that, yeah, good. Make sure, I want to make sure I'm fair to Ilya. I always try to be fair. Um, I, don't, I don't have much of a rejoinder to that because we are living in a world with nearly 200 years of uh, precedent, both in terms of the executive branch and the courts. Um, and, and for the courts to suddenly say Congress has no role over immigration would be a radical, radical departure. Um, perhaps we can start with Lochner and work our way back to this and sort of in terms of presence we want to get rid of. But the general idea here is that this was not an effort to husband resources. And I'll give you one final anecdote. About a month, I'm sorry, now three months ago in USV, Texas, the Supreme Court divided four to four. The Antonin Scalia Law School, God bless you. Uh, because of Nino's passing, the court tied four to four. That day, President Obama appeared in the Rose Garden again. You know what he said? To all those people who would have benefited from DAPA, you have nothing to worry about. We're not going to remove you. Your status is not different. Whoa. He just gave the game away. He said, with or without DAPA, I'm not going to remove you. That was always the case. The president never had to remove the parents of U.S. citizens. Those could always be made the lowest priority. The only reason why this policy exists is to, quote, bring them out of the shadows, give them lawful presence, and make them these quasi-citizens that Congress would not. And this, my friends, is illegal. Stop. Thank you very much. I look forward to responding to Ilya in a moment. So I'd like to thank the Federal Society for organizing this event, Jeremy for what I'm sure will be his able moderation, uh, and one of our most <laughs> distinguished graduates, Josh Blackman, for his 
uh, excellent presentation and participation in this debate. He is certainly my former student. We're very proud of his achievements, particularly his excellent books on Obamacare. However, in contemplating his work on this particular issue, I feel a little bit like Obi-Wan Kenobi contemplating the uh, betrayal of Anakin Skywalker. <laughs> Josh has gone over to the dark side on this issue. But there is still hope, my friends. I know, Josh, there is still good in you. And perhaps with the help of the Force, we will yet bring it out. Uh, so I will start by talking about the nature of the laws that President Obama uh, is limiting the enforcement of in these cases, because those laws are indeed unconstitutional under the original meaning of the Constitution. In some ways, that's a radical position. It's exactly the same position as was held by such radicals as James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Gallatin, many of the other founding fathers, and was the dominant view for the first hundred years of our history, where uh, Congress, generally speaking, obeyed this restriction that it didn't have a general power over immigration. I'm not going to go over all the different creative arguments that people have offered to justify the modern doctrine, which goes back to the racist Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s. But I will go through uh, the most common arguments offered to justify this power. One is indeed the naturalization clause. As the word naturalization implies, this is not a power to restrict immigration. It is merely a power to decide what foreigners are able to become US citizens and which ones are not. Both the founding fathers and we today understood that people often live in places where they are not citizens. And the power to grant citizenship is a very different power than the power to restrict movement across boundaries. Uh, certainly, uh, that was one of the founders. The other argument, the one that would often be offered today, uh, is that this comes under the commerce power. And Congress does have a power to regulate foreign commerce. but. Uh, not only at the time of the founding, but until at least the 1930s, both the court and most other legal experts and jurists fully recognize that the power to regulate commerce is not just the power to regulate all movement. Otherwise, the power to regulate interstate commerce, which occurs in the exact same clause of the Constitution, would be a power to forbid Americans from moving from one state to another. And nobody at the time the original meaning thought that that was the case. And uh, they didn't think it was the case for decades uh, thereafter either. Uh, some people, including the Supreme Court in the Chinese exclusion case, we discussed the danger posed by hordes of evil Chinese immigrants who can't be assimilated. So they said, uh, they said, well, we can't find this power anywhere in the text of the Constitution, but it's got to be inherent. It must be all governments have this power, uh, sounding a little bit like Donald Trump, where he says we're not a real nation unless we have these borders. Well, by that standard, the US not a real nation for the first century of its history, where except for the br very brief Alien and Sedition Act, which was quickly eliminated as unconstitutional, Congress, in fact, didn't have generalized immigration restrictions on foreigners. So it's just not true that this power is one that any, every nation must have. And even if it was true, there are lots of powers that are enumerated that are much more fundamental, like the power to declare war, for example. So it's simply not the case that any power that many people consider extremely important has to be found somewhere in the text of the Constitution. In this case, it just ain't there. Now, this is not to say that Congress has no power to ever restrict the movement of any foreigners under some of its other powers. It can restrict the movement of particular people, for instance, the power to declare war, uh, the power to spend money for the national defense, and the like can restrict the movement of terrorists, foreign armies, and so forth. Uh, but there's no generalized power to restrict people's movement simply because they happen to be born in another country. It just doesn't exist. I don't propose that we can immediately overrule the cases from the 1880s, but certainly the fact that this is unconstitutional, I think, provides additional justification for the president's action here. We have a three-level system of protection for individual liberty. Uh, first, it can't be violated if it passes a law. Second, it can't be violated unless the judiciary approves it. But third, uh, the executive has to take action to enforce it. And it can choose not to take that action if they believe the law is unconstitutional. This is what uh, President Jefferson did with the Alien and Sedition Act. And this, I think, is the justification for what Obama did here. Wasn't his motive, but I think here the action matters more than the motive. If you look for good motives among politicians, you will rarely find them. But not only in this case, but in most others, most of what they do is for short-term political advantage. Uh, that just is the sad but true reality.
Now, let's assume power does exist. Uh, still, uh, what the president did is not unconstitutional for the very simple reason that he does, in fact, have discretion to decide which laws to enforce and which ones not. A core subject, over 70% of Americans have violated federal criminal law at some point. More have violated federal civil law. And by the way, the law that we're talking about here is actually civil, uh, not criminal. So the president can only uh, enforce the law against a tiny minority uh, of the uh, lawbreakers out there. We're really all federal criminals out there, if you like. Uh, and he must pick and choose. Uh, much of the time, uh, they pick and choose in a so-called case-by-case manner. And many people say, well, here, it's not case-by-case. Case. I say a decision you can make in a case-by-case case basis, the president can make systematically. Uh, the systematic criteria you can use is humanitarian considerations, how much of a threat these particular people pose, and so forth. If you can use those criteria on a case-by-case case basis, you can use it at a generalized basis too. And that's particularly important to believe in the unitary executive, that the powers of the executive branch must be concentrated in the hands of the president. Uh, in the modern extensive bureaucratic state, often the only way that the president can be a unitary executive is by issuing generalized instructions to his subordinates, which is exactly uh, what he has done here. Uh, now, uh, Josh, I think, agrees with someone who says, well, this is different. It doesn't conserve resources. My answer is that sure it does. Uh, if there's millions of people who you might otherwise round up and deport, or who you might otherwise have to have case-by-case -case deliberations about, uh, that can save resources. And certainly, uh, it can, uh, uh, certainly a president could reasonably believe that it does. Uh, moreover, uh, when we talk about saving resources, saving resources is not a value-neutral exercise. Uh, the saving of resources is relative to expending those resources for some particular purpose. Uh, and whether you're saving resources or instead causes harm is going to in part depend on whether you think this is actually a good in the first place. So uh, the president decided that supporting this four or five million people uh, is a less good use of resources than enforcing other kinds of federal laws. Uh, there is a value judgment here, but there really is a value judgment behind almost all exercises of executive discretion. How do you know that it is, in fact, discretion, uh, but not changing the law? The answer is that this doesn't actually legalize anything that was previously legal. Uh, what's actually legal here, if you assume that Congress is the power, is crossing the border. They can wake up on the wrong side of their bed. They can say, you know what, I want to deport these people, and they can order that done, and it would be done. Uh, and whereas if they actually had legal status, amnesty, or whatever you want to call it, it wouldn't be possible for the president uh, to, in fact, do it. Now, Josh and others say, well, this is different. There are affirmative benefits here, not just non-enforcement. One of them is authorization for employment. This, however, is in fact specifically authorized by the law, the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, which says that aliens who otherwise might be legal can be employed if, quote, they are authorized to be employed by the Attorney General. That's what it says, very clear. And of course, uh, Obama has instructed the Attorney General to authorize these people. You can say this grants too much discretion to the President, but it's right there in the text of the law. He's not doing anything that's unauthorized. Lastly, there is this term, lawful presence, which Josh has pointed to. That sounds like it must be really important, lawful presence. In reality, uh, it's almost completely insignificant. Why? Because there's no such thing as unlawful presence. Being present in the U.S., even as an illegal alien, is not itself unlawful. Strange but true. What is unlawful is crossing the border illegally. Uh, but that, uh, what Obama's action is not actually legalized in any way. The lawful presence may make you eligible in time for certain federal benefits if you're not deported in the meantime. But in general, it's an utterly insignificant part of this action. It doesn't grant these people much of anything. If the court is fixated on this, they could easily just strike down this part while leaving the whole rest uh, intact. We can talk about perhaps the severability aspects of this later. Finally, the take care clause. Uh, I think Josh has taken some good care to tell us more about this clause than uh, probably we knew before. It's an understudied part of the Constitution. Uh, but it's hard to say exactly what it means, but it certainly does not mean that the president must enforce all laws all the time. That's an impossibility. It also, I think, does not mean that he can't exercise his discretion systematically as opposed to on a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe it means he has some 
responsibility to act in good faith, but I think you are acting in good faith if you make decisions based on which of the many what categories of lawbreakers you think are more important for the public interest to go after and which ones are less important. Uh, if you look at the historical sources on this, it seems like the main part of this clause was to prevent what was at the time called suspension. That is, the president saying something that is on the books is illegal. Uh, is oh, George Mason wrote about this extensively, of okay. course, okay. over there. Okay, uh, so I still have lots of time left in the card, uh, and I will actually need <laughs> some of it. So we will get to George Mason, I promise you. But for now, I want to finish the point that I was actually making, uh, which is the uh, fact that uh, a suspension, what this clause is actually intended to ban, is the president saying something that is otherwise uh, illegal becomes legal. Here, the president hasn't done that. He's merely said that uh, I'm not going to enforce the law, at least for the time being, against certain categories of people, but I'm not claiming that they cross the border legally. I'm just claiming that I'm not going to go after them until I change my mind or until one of my successors does. So the take care clause, uh, I think, does not forbid this sort of action. And it's worth noting that when this case was before the Supreme Court, sorry to say, the one issue that hardly any of the justices took any interest at all in in the uh, oral argument, even those justices who didn't like the president's action otherwise, they did not focus on the take care clause, even though the late Justice Scalia uh, was interested in the take care clause, but the oral argument this uh, and, and before this didn't come up. Maybe, was he still alive during the oral argument? I think he may not have been. Scalia was there when cert was granted, but not when it was argued. Okay. So maybe he would have asked about it during the oral argument, but we'll never know because sadly he passed away uh, before that, but it's notable that none of the other eight justices at least took an well, interest in seven who asked questions at least. There's seven asked questions, yes. It could be. We don't, we don't really know what Thomas thinks, uh, and we still don't know because the Supreme Court issued no opinion in this case. Uh, so uh, I don't know what will happen with this case if it comes back. It could go different ways. Uh, but I think it's safe to predict, I'll go on a women and say, whichever way is decided in the future, there will not be a majority for striking down the president's action based on the take care clause. It might be struck down based on administrative law considerations or based on other types of considerations, some of which we might talk about later in this debate, but I think uh, I can very carefully say that the take care clause uh, will not take care of this particular issue. And on that note, I will stop, but I look forward to Josh's rebuttal, mine, and all of your great questions. Thank you. And, and I do feel like this is an Obi-Wan, uh, you know, Luke, uh, Darth Vader brawl. So my response to Ilya will be focusing on the statute, because he moved to the statutory law. When Congress in 1986 Create that provision he referenced that said people with lawful presence get work authorization. Um, the executive branch was asked, how many people will get this status? And note the executive branch replied, so few people it's not worth calculating. Uh, that's almost a verbatim quote. This was a provision designed for a fairly limited, narrow scope of executive relief. And I'll give you a very easy example of how deferred action been used in the past. Now, in 2005, imagine you are a foreign law student studying at Tulane University in New Orleans, right? You were there, and then Hurricane Katrina slams into the Gulf. Your school shuts down. You had a legal status because you were a student, but now that the school is closed and you have no classes, you are no longer eligible for foreign uh, legal status. You're, you're, you're subject to removal. What the Hold on. If you enroll at another university the next semester, we will give you deferred action for a couple months. Deferred action has historically been used as a bridge from one lawful status to another. You had something, and there's something waiting on the other end of it. Give you an, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, there were these wide-ranging reforms passed by Presidents Bush and Reagan, where Republicans liked immigration reform. Um, this often gave a person lawful status. Hey, we're going to defer your action for a fairly short time until your family members naturalize, then they can move for an adjustment of your status. Okay. Again, there was some end of the rainbow. It's like you know, the pot of gold waiting for them. What's significantly different about DAPA here, and this is an argument that both the U.S. I'm sorry, the Texas Solicitor General and Congress adopted from my writings, is there's no path here. At DAPA, the DAPA beneficiaries are in the exact same spot they're in now. They have no prospect of relief absent congressional reform. This is why this is a bypass. The president's words are very clear. Congress will not act, so I will. He is taking statutes that cannot, five million grants, 
and using them in a way to ignore a Congress that was not willing to advance his agenda. And there's no precedent for this. There isn't. There isn't. And by the way, the George W. Bush, I'm sorry, the George thing that's often bandied about, that was under an old statute that was repealed in 1996. So you can't even rely on that anymore. There was a statute modified in 1996. You can't rely anymore. And that's why the Office of Legal Counsel made a point of saying, well, you know, when the president decides not to enforce the law, there's a distinct list risk that he is, in fact, suspending the law. So what avoids this sort of suspension? A case-by-case -case basis. DACA and DAPA would not be case-by-case. -case. The grant rate was over 97% for DACA. And let me tell you something. The court asked the government many times, can you give us a single example, one, of a person denied DACA for purely discretionary reasons? They could not give one. Everyone had a, they had a crime or this arrest or this adjudication. The government could not find a single case of someone denied for discretionary reasons. This, my friends, was a rubber stamp. The very change here, and the one that George Mason feared of, was not merely of suspension, but what's called the separation of powers. See, King George III had this habit where he would not only suspend the laws of the colonies, but he would also ask them to change it. There's something called the assent, right? If you read the declaration, you need the king's assent. The king would say, okay, colonies, if you want to pass this law, make this tweak to it. Make that change, make this change. So the king was not only acting in executive, in a legislative function, and this was a striking change in the declaration. It's like, we do not want the king's assent to make our laws. It's right in there, read it. It's, it's there, I promise. What we're having here is the president is taking actions to change the law. This is not what the law means. It's not a reasonable construction. And he was banking on the fact that no one's standing to challenge him. This actions cannot stand. Uh, whether or not the Supreme Court agrees with this, I think they're cognizant of the fact that this is something very dangerous. And if they want to rule on narrow statutory grounds to avoid this broad constitutional ruling, I'm okay with that. But this cannot pass under current precedent. Thank you. So I thank Josh for that interesting rebuttal, but I fear it shows that he has gone further towards the dark side in a way that might make Justice Scalia turn over in his grave. Because one of Justice Scalia's <laughs> most important principles was about how you interpret statutes. How do you do it? You look at the text. You don't look at the legislative history or how people thought it might work out or how many people might have been covered in the like. You look at what's actually in the text of the law. And here, the text is extremely clear. Who can be granted work status? Those people who are authorized by the Attorney General. It doesn't say only if there's not too many of them. It doesn't say only if there's not a bridge. It doesn't say only if it's the kind of people that George H.W. Bush thought should be granted uh, this presence. It's very clear on the text. Congress could have limited based on the number of people, based on whether it's a bridge, based on probably a hundred other different ways, but they didn't do that. Yes, the president, to get this passed, might have said, you know what, it's going to be pretty limited, but the limitation was you know, his own exercise of discretion. Now, it, it is true it's unprecedented in the sense of the numbers of people involved. Maybe that violates a kind of political norm. I said so myself that it does in my uh, blog posts on this subject, but violating political norms, while it might be a bad thing, is not illegal. And if we're going to talk about violations of political norms, there are plenty of them on both sides of this debate. For instance, in the history that Josh mentioned of this legislation, the history is largely accurate, but he didn't mention the fact that there actually was a majority in the House of Representatives for passing uh, this bill. Uh, John Boehner chose not to let it go to the floor because he imposed the so-called Hastert rule, named after the former House Speaker, Dennis Hastert, who I think is now in prison for applied the Hastert rule to this legislation. Uh, and this was a relatively new innovation to that. Perfectly legal, perfectly constitutional, but a violation of political norms. In an era of extreme polarization, many political norms get violated. Boehner violated one norm. Obama violated another. But neither of them acted uh, illegally. Uh, now, uh, with respect to the issue of changing the law, I would just make the same point that I made earlier. This doesn't make legal anything that was illegal before. It merely says we're not going to enforce it against certain categories of people. It's true it may be generalized rather than case by case, but that's not a constitutionally meaningful distinction. As I suggested earlier, any case by case discretion that is not completely arbitrary, there's not just a matter of flipping a coin or the like, must be based on some kind of general rules, rules about and principles about how important this law breaking is, how useful it will be to spend resources on this versus something else. 
and so forth. And if you can make that decision on an individual basis, you can certainly make it systematically. Indeed, that's the only way the president can exercise the powers of the unitary executive, uh, particularly in the modern world. Uh, finally, about George Mason and George III and the royal assent, I think it's pretty obvious that there's no principle of presidential or royal assent involved here. In a sense, we actually do have a principle of presidential assent because the president can choose to veto legislation, and he can even uh, choose not to sign it and exercise the so-called pocket veto, but none of that is really involved here. Uh, the president is not saying that Congress's legislation is go after them, but will we'll still go after others. You can say it's too large a scale of doing it. You can say it's bad political behavior on his part, uh, but it isn't unconstitutional. doesn't violate the statutory law either. And on that note, I very much look forward to questions. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so just before we have this part of our discussion, could I call on Josh just to explain the posture of the case now? Oh, I'd be happy to. Right, you, decision, the Justice Department follows. You know, Ilya's worst night, or Donald Trump wins the election, right? I mean, it, it's possible, whatever, right? Um, this case goes away because he's going to rescind Doppel. The case dies. The, the case goes away. Okay. In the event that there's a Clinton administration, the case will still be prosecuted. Now, if Clinton appoints, and we can talk about this later, but uh, appoints a ninth justice, the court may simply just hold the motion for consideration indefinitely until Judge Garland is confirmed, at which point they can rule on the case once. In the event that Clinton wins, then we have a Republican Senate. Well, then things get interesting. So we may not have a justice for a while. I'm not being facetious. I can see a scenario that say, no, keep it at eight. Um, uh, and that's entirely foreseeable. So this case may not be resolved. But throughout all this, Judge Hainan's injunction from the district stays. And President Clinton or Obama cannot enforce DAPA so long as this is in place. That, that's the status of the case, General. Thank you. I, 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 would, I would mention... What Josh said is basically correct. I mentioned basically <laughs> a, a couple of uh, things here, which is that uh, Obama, Clinton, or for that matter, Trump, if he, if he, if whoever wins the election, always has the option of just modifying the executive action. Uh, and one possible modification, one I propose, is simply to drop the lawful presence part, as I mentioned before, uh, has very little legal significance, but does get people tied up into knots. It was. Unlike the take care clause, it was much discussed at the oral argument. Uh, so that's one option they have. Obviously, they can also modify the action in all kinds of other ways. And if it's modified, then potentially you would end up starting up new litigation over the new order, assuming Texas, or at least some of the states involved, would choose to challenge that, which I think at least some of them would want to do. Uh, so that's another possibility. Uh, and it's also possible that instead of the Supreme Court taking up the case, it will continue at the lower court level, moving from the preliminary injunction stage uh, up to uh, further levels. So I think unless Donald Trump wins, we probably haven't seen the end of this issue. Yeah. Uh, if it does return to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, it might lead to a significant opinion, though it's also possible that it will be resolved in some way at the lower court level without the Supremes uh, granting cert. I hope this is a yes or no question. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> district, the district court um, injunction applies to the whole country? Yes. Yes, and let, let me address that. So what we have here was a Same coalition. Yes. We have here is a coalition of 26 states who challenged it, and they sought what's called a district, a nationwide injunction. This is actually a very good Civ Pro question for some learners here, maybe talk about that later. But, but, but this is a very important Civ Pro issue. Can a single district court enjoin the entire country? Um, here I do think it's appropriate because you're talking about a Homeland Security official who has jurisdiction of the entire United States. You have a uniform immigration policy. It makes sense here. But this is actually a very tricky CIVPRO question that, that has not been fully fleshed out. Yes. OK, good. So let's um, go to the floor. You're first. Yes, sir. So by extension of your logic, the president could choose to ignore enforcement of any law of Congress. So let's say we're going to go with somebody else's fair taxing policy. It makes under $1,000 a year. We're not going to enforce it. Yeah. Yes, he and this could, would work. yes, he could do that. The constraint in such actions is political. That uh, if a law is broadly enough supported, the president would suffer severe political damage if he did that. Uh, if, uh, as in this case, there is broad opposition to it, he won't. You may say, well, that's terrible. Different from time when the president still chooses to go after only a tiny fraction of all the lawbreakers out there uh, and does it on a kind of 
You can call it a case-by-case -case basis if you like, but as a practical matter, in many situations, it turns out to be a categorical exclusion. For example, many of you, like me, probably went to college in places where there were a lot of students, not you necessarily, but a lot of students, were using marijuana. That's illegal <laughs> under federal law. Yet, it virtually never is the case that federal law enforcement officials come to college campuses and arrest the many students who are using marijuana legally under federal law. It's unlike uh, this immigration relationship, that actually is a criminal offense. So as a practical matter, the federal government has a blanket policy of never going to college campuses to punish students for uh, these violations, whereas people in other places for violating this particular federal law, you can say that's abusive, it's favoritism, it shouldn't be done, but it happens all the time. If you don't like it, the solution is to have less federal law and to reduce the scope of federal law to those broad political consensus that it should be enforced. Then the president would suffer severe political backlash whenever he chose to exclude a large category of people from enforcement. But with the marijuana law, with immigration law, with lots of other laws out there, uh, we just don't have that kind of consensus. I would mention also enforcement of a wide variety of petty OSHA regulations against small businesses. As a practical matter, many of them are almost never imposed against small businesses with modest violations. You can say that's favoritism. It shouldn't be done. But happens all the time. So I agree with you, this is actually not a good state of affairs, uh, but we already have it. Uh, well, in this or, case, do we? or do we? Have, how many of you in your college campuses were given a card saying, you are now allowed to smoke pot, we will not arrest you? See, that's a difference. It's not simply non-enforcement. It's, 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 it's an enforcement. <laughs> It's actually a licensing of you doing something that is not allowed. And not only that, we'll give you free rolling paper, too, yeah, so you yeah. can help, so you know. This is a distinction without much difference. Oh, it's a huge difference. No, because as a practical matter, pretty much anybody who uses marijuana on a college campus can be, can be very confident it can, the feds will never enforce it against him. It's already well known to the relevant population of lawbreakers. He went to, he went to, he went to Amherst. No, well, Williams. I'm sorry. He went to, went to Amherst. Williams. Hey, well, Williams uh, is our evil rival. That's right, that's right. Uh, so, uh, I don't know about it. Uh, uh, Williams, maybe people interrupt, but here at George Mason, we try to keep them from doing so. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 be that as it may, the point is the difference between Obama's policy and the one about marijuana on college campuses is that this one is transparent to the general population and not just to the lawbreakers who are directly affected. So, if anything, uh, it is more uh, in accordance with sort of civic split democratic governance than what is done with respect to marijuana, uh, OSHA, and so forth, where the relevant population of lawbreakers well understands what's going on, but the general public may be less aware. So, back there. You should speak up because it's being recorded for a national audience. It's okay. I can I can hear just fine. Um, so in regards to discretion, I think you said something along the lines of that if, that if we're merely to kind of reduce cost or for efficiency purposes, we would be people at the bottom of the deportation list, then that would be justified. And I guess I'm trying to think of an example where that sort of discretion would not be based on someone's kind of values or judgments that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, Well, because that's a valid judgment for Congress. So Congress has made a very specific judgment at the parents with U.S. citizen children. Um, this is the anchor baby myth, and I call it a myth deliberately. When the Immigration Nationality Act was passed in 1965, so almost 50 years ago, there was this great colloquy between Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, I think it was Sam Irvin and the other one, and they said this point, I was like, well, wait a minute, right? All these parents will come here illegally, and they're going to have children. We can't have their kids becoming citizens. So that's why they imposed this 21-year gap between the child's birth and when the child can petition for an adjustment status. This was very specific from Congress. Congress said, we do not want parents who are not citizens and getting the adjustment status. This is a really clear violation. So I appreciate the humanitarian concerns, but that was not the concern of Congress. So but is there any other sort of value that you could use just for like that example of moving people to a bottom of the list? Because you said that it was possible in theory, but I can't Right. So I, I think in terms of prioritizing criminals above fa families, right, you only have Congress allocates about 400, I'm sorry, Congress allocates enough money to remove about 400,000 people a year. That, that's the rough number, right? So if you can only deport 400,000 out of 11 million and they say there are 500,000 criminals, 
Um, I think it's entirely consistent with statutory law to put the criminals at the top. The problem here is this granting of lawful presence, which is not a lot of nothing. This was a serious point of contention at the Supreme Court. The government tried to say, well, lawful presence carries no weight. Then why was it added? The reason why it was added to the policy was to get you the work authorization, to get you out of the shadows. They simply said, we will not remove you. These people are still in the shadows. And that's the exact status quo the president's trying to alter. I think we're making a little bit of progress here and getting Josh back into your excellent question. Josh seems to have retreated from the position he took earlier where he said, well, it, this is bad because it's systematic and it's a rubber stamp. Uh, now he says it can be perfectly well be a rubber stamp for priori absolute priority for, for the others, uh, but the only problem is the lawful presence or the work authorization that I just suggested. The work authorizations are actually specifically authorized by statute, whereas the lawful presence is an extremely minor matter that uh, doesn't really do much of anything. So we are actually making progress. I'm not ready to readmit him to the Jedi Order quite yet, uh, but we're getting there. You know, I never read the Lord of the Rings books. He still gives me crap for that. <laughs> Deservedly so. <laughs> uh, let's have some more excellent I, I didn't say any legal right. I said no general power. General power. Yeah. Uh, Who does have the power? There, there is under the Constitution, at least for the federal government, no general power to restrict immigration in a sense of excluding people simply because they happen to be born in another country or happen not to be U.S. citizens. There is, on the other hand, power to exclude certain particular categories of people under other powers of Congress. For example, uh, people who are parts of foreign armies, spies, terrorists, uh, and so forth. Uh, there are other categories, people engaged in illegal international commerce or the like. Uh, so uh, I think that's the framework. Uh, it served us well for the first hundred years of our history until Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, generated primarily by racist hatred of the Chinese, who are thought to be unassimilable and harmful. Uh, and I think uh, while I don't advocate the Supreme Court immediately reversing the uh, press, I think that's impractical. What I do think the court should do is incrementally move in that direction, and the rest of society should do so as well. Uh, we should be the nation of the Statue of Liberty, not the nation of walls and deportations, uh, being more like this is what will really help make America great again. So and how many people were turned away from the Statue of Liberty, went to Ellis Island? People uh, turned back it, there also. It, 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 <laughs> after 1882, some were turned away, though only a tiny minority and only for things like dangerous, contagious diseases and the like. Nobody, however, was turned away simply because they happened to be born in a foreign country. So, Professor Summer, do you see this as, as a separation of powers issue and maybe related to non-delegation power of, of uh, and I'll reply to that one also. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Uh, I think it could be the case that the that there is excessive delegation in that provision in the 1986 Act that I mentioned. Uh, if so, however, it's no different from a very large swath of the rest of the modern state where there's broad delegations. If you want to avoid those kind of delegations, you will need to significantly cut back the government as it currently exists because you can't operate the modern administrative state without broad delegations like this. Uh, but yes, uh, there could potentially be a non-delegation issue though that wasn't uh, litigated. Uh, but if you're willing to be radical about non-delegation, you should also be willing to be radical about the immigration points I mentioned earlier. And I personally would be very happy if we could eventually get to a point where non-delegation was rigorously enforced, but also limits on congressional power over immigration as well. So let's quote Justice Scalia, right? <laughs> what did Justice Scalia say? Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes. Yeah, there it is. You know, major question doctrine, right? When Congress passes a statute saying you can grant this work authorization, there was an understanding, legislative history or otherwise, of the scope of this. And Scalia said in these sorts of cases, Congress will not give it. If Congress could give this power away, it nullifies half the immigration code. If the AG can give lawful presence to anyone he wants, books and books and books are irrelevant. And to continue, in the case of Arizona versus United States, which considered Arizona's attempt to regulate immigration, Scalia dissented. But he talked about DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, and he said, it has come to this, that we have the president not enforcing laws he doesn't like. So what would Justice Scalia, the namesake of my alma mater, say? <laughs> Illegal. So let me say uh, something about <laughs> the elephants in the mouse holes. 
There ain't no mouse hole here. The elephant is right there in the text of the statute where Justice Scalia will tell you that's exactly where it should be. We should read the text, not this legislative history for which all kinds of crap can go into the legislative history, uh, but it only matters if it actually goes into the text of the statute. Didn't in this case, on his dissent in the Arizona case, I don't fully agree with the stuff that he said there, but he said something interesting, which said that if you look back historically, the power of the federal government over immigration was questionable, as he put it. Uh, looking back in the 18th and 19th century history I mentioned earlier, uh, what he said was less questionable, at least he should have added before the Reconstruction Amendments, was the power of the states, which was what was at stake uh, in the Arizona case. So I think at least as a matter of original meaning, Scalia possibly might have uh, been open to raising questions about the scope of congressional power in this area. Uh, he didn't write about this very extensively, but what he said in that opinion suggests that he recognized at least the problem here, and he certainly recognized that there would be a big problem if you're privileging legislative history and somewhat ambiguous legislative history at that over what it actually says in the statute, where there simply aren't the kind of exceptions that uh, Justice Blackman here would like to read Whoa, into. Whoa, another Justice Blackman. <laughs> okay, exactly. You, you had a question on that, right? It was basically, you mentioned administrative law issues, uh, kind of touched on those. I was wondering, is that President Obama's violation of like, rulemaking procedures? Or yes, what? yes, yes. So I have a new piece coming out of the Harvard Law Review this fall called Ooh. Gridlock. Ooh, right, Ooh. fancy pants, right? <laughs> uh, Harvard Law Review this fall called Gridlock, where I discuss why this case was such an administrative travesty. Um, beyond the rulemaking process, this was done in such a way that could not be challenged. The president structured it that it would be paid for by fees, people applying for this. Congress could not defund this. Even if the entire Department of Homeland Security was shut down, this program would, con would continue. And this was done deliberately. The president thought that no one can stop it. Only because Texas, and Professor Rapkin and I joined this amicus brief supporting Texas, filed this suit. To this. All the stuff we know about DACA and DAPA came to light because of discovery in this case. Had this suit not been filed, we would have never known how this thing operated. Orange shirt. Orange, yeah. Professor Somi. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well, it seems that, of course, you agree with Justice Scalia in general, um, legislative history, or by extension, original intent. Original um, meaning. Original meaning. Original meaning, okay. Does not, uh, when it conflicts with the clear text, the clear text prevails over the original meaning. So there's clear original meaning, clear text. Clear tax prevails. Is there, do you believe there is any, do you to this rule, where clear original meaning can actually prevail over clear tax? And for your consideration, I want to offer the example of the origination clause of the Constitution. As you, as you probably know, at the, Constitution, at the Constitutional Convention, there was a massive debate over how, um, over how the, the procedure of how bills would, would, would pass and become legislation. Some were concerned that the United States Senate, I mean, if, some were concerned that if uh, all legislation whatsoever um, could originate in either house, they, for example, would have power to, um, to, tax, uh, to tax the people. Um, that time, they were not, of course, they were not being, they were not accountable to the people. And of course, um, Benjamin Franklin came up with a solution. He said, all, all tax bills, all bills for revenue, shall be in the House of the House of Representatives. All other laws can originate in either house. Coming? Yes. Ask it. Okay. So what I'm saying is that there's much original, no. there's much evidence to believe that the House of Representatives, or at least the, those from the Constitutional Convention, um, didn't just intend that the Senate uh, not propose, oh, excuse me, um, tax bills. Oh, sorry, I'm looking, but um. There's much original, there's much evidence to suggest the set, that the those of the Constitution, Constitutional Convention did not want the Senate, not want the Senate to have the power to actually propose any taxes whatsoever. Whereas the the plain text of the U.S. Constitution says that the Senate should not have the Senate should not have power to um, to propose tax bills. What I'm saying is actually. Never mind, okay. Sorry. So I'll try to answer your general question without trying to address the origination clause. I'm reluctant to say that uh, this is an iron law of legal interpretation that admits of no exceptions in any possible situation whatsoever. I'm skeptical of the general idea that 
there can never be such an iron law that applies in all conceivable states of the universe. What I will say is that there should be a very strong presumption in favor of following the text, particularly when it's clear, and at least in this particular case, I see no reason to overturn that presumption, uh, either from the standpoint of originalism or even from the standpoint of sort of pragmatic or living constitution considerations. It could be, as I mentioned earlier, that there's a violation of political norms here, uh, and maybe you know, Obama deserves to be criticized for doing that, uh, but violations of political norms are not uh, themselves illegal or unconstitutional. Uh, okay, another question? Yeah. You said a question for Professor Solomon. Um, so if the president has the authority to suspend any legislation or any law that he Not wants, suspend, not enforce. Or not enforce any law that he wants, um, mechanism is just to check his power. I, already, I think I answered that in a similar question I was asked before. The mechanism is twofold. One is uh, political backlash. The other is, in the long run, Congress can curb the extent of federal law, restrict federal law to those areas where there's a broad consensus that they should be strictly enforced, and then the president would suffer severe political damage any time he did something like this. In the current state of affairs, it's pretty much inevitable that either explicitly or implicitly, the president will end up excluding the lawbreakers from any kind of effective enforcement. That's an unfortunate state of affairs. It creates room for all kinds of abuses. Uh, but uh, it existed long before this particular action. And if we want to get rid of it, the pathway is A, to restrict the scope of federal law politically, and B, to enforce constitutional limits on the scope of federal law. This problem wouldn't exist if Congress, and at least in the immigration area, it wouldn't exist if Congress wasn't exercising unconstitutional authority in the first place. Wait, so new questions? New questioners? No one? Well, in that case, I'll respond to it. Well, no, Tiffany, no. what time do we finish? Um, this is the last question. Okay, last question. Go for it. Well, I'd like to get both of your stances on it because you want to keep the borders closed. Uh, I, 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 I well, mean, not closed, policy matters. We shouldn't matter, have yeah. borders. Somebody else, uh, borders. we shouldn't have borders. I want to give Professor Selman an opportunity to support this claim. And would this not require the abolishment of all social, social program subsidies and any opportunity to free ride in this country to support your proposition? No. Uh, this is really a policy question that has nothing to do with the Constitution, but the answer is that eligibility for welfare programs and the like is a different matter and Congress can and already does under the 1996 Welfare Reform Act limit eligibility for a wide range of programs to citizens. It can limit it further. Moreover, when you look at studies on this, it is simply not the case that immigration, whether legal, illegal, Inc or illegal increases welfare spending on net. If you compare states with large proportions of immigrants in a population to states with few and control for other variables, uh, the states with larger proportions do not have higher welfare spending. If you look at countries in Europe, countries with higher proportions of immigrants actually tend to have lower levels of welfare spending. So I think this is a false trade-off. It is often made, by particularly by people on the right. But the truth of the matter is that free migration either has very little effect on the size of welfare state or actually reduces it. Uh, if you want a really big welfare state, this might actually pose, at least in the case of Europe, some difficult trade-offs for you. If you want the opposite, it sounds like you do want the opposite, I may be wrong about that, then actually immigration is a win-win. Uh, it increases freedom and reduces government involvement in the economy with respect to immigration itself, which is a big deal. Uh, and it also doesn't increase uh, welfare spending and may actually reduce it a little at the margin. So, I just want to say, um, it's been a very interesting, so I'll thank the uh, speakers here. <laughs> On your way out, the Federalist Society is offering free copies of the Constitution. Read the entire document, and I faithfully. Com I commend to your attention uh, our oh, in Section 8, which has a list of the powers of Congress, and among other things that is not there is the power to issue paper money. That's right. And, and to make it a media Fiat exchange. currency, I would say it makes And the next time Professor Simon uh, is engaged in a debate, all people will ask, can we make them stop doing that? <laughs> Flooding uh, the country with paper money, which is not really reliable. Yeah. Well, in, in no, the... That's the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Read the legal tender cases where Chief Justice yeah. uh, Chase makes exactly that point. Uh, as we submit a original meeting, he was right about that. Okay. Uh, we're done. We're done. <laughs>